Hey Hi, everyone. Hi. I just screamed into the microphone once again. Hi, Mara Dolan. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Going Disparate uh, podcast with Pam and Mara. I am your host, Pam Rogers. And I'm your co-host, Mara Dolan. I'm the Democrat, which means that Pamela Rogers must be the Republican. Yes, that's correct. And I think I just scared you again by like yelling into my microphone this week. I, I feel like I scared you last week. <laughs> no, I didn't scare you. you don't scare me. <laughs> Part of the beauty of the show. <laughs> that's great. I know. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, we're going to be celebrating July 4th this week. It's so super exciting. We are. And you know what? I just realized something else we need to promote, Pam. We are going on another podcast. We are going to be guests on Conversations with Warrior Women. So looking forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be a great, um, it's a great talk. So uh, Liz Swadek is the host of Conversations with Warrior Women. And I think she's had her podcast going for over three years. It might even be four years now. Um, and it's a fantastic podcast. So everyone should it check is. it out, hit subscribe, follow her. Um, it's going to be really fun. Yeah, we're going to be on that. We'll let everyone know when that episode drops so everyone can hear it. Yes. And we will, we will post it on our platforms as well. You can always find us on social media at Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, at Go and Despair It. You can find us on all your podcast platforms, whether it's Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, whatever it is, we're there. We'd love to have you subscribe and give us a five star review if you like us well enough, which I, which from what I hear from the feedback I'm getting, people are really liking the show, but you've been able to find us, but by subscribing and giving us a five star review, you'll make it possible for other people to find us as well. And we'll grow our audience. So thank you so much. And exactly. email us. We want to know what you think. Pam and Mara at gmail.com. Yes. And you can watch our shows on YouTube. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. That's why we, that's why we get dressed up all pretty. So <laughs> we do these. And actually I'm wearing my, I'm wearing pearls today. I always feel a little self-conscious when I wear pearls because they're just such a stereotype, you know, pearl clutching and all yes. that, but I like them. Yeah. It's I like very them. pretty. It's very they're Barbara, nice. Barbara Bush. Remember Barbara Bush always had yeah, all that's the pearls. Me. I'm, I am the new Barbara Bush. That's for sure. <laughs> I loved her. Thanks, I absolutely Pam. loved her. Thank you. Sure. So, Hey, you know what? I, while we have a minute, we do what's going on with your campaign. Oh my goodness, folks. So thank you. That's very nice of you to ask. Pam. I'm running for governor's it. council in Massachusetts In Massachusetts. We wisely do not elect our judges, but we do elect the people who approve them. That's the governor's council. And they also approve our parole board members and who gets a commutation and a pardon. I'm running to be the first public defender on the governor's council. So since the Supreme Court established the right to court-appointed counsel for criminal defendants who couldn't afford to hire their own attorney, that was in 1963, we've had 52 governor's counselors. Guess how many have been a public defender, Pam? How many? Zero. Wow. I'm running to be the first. That's so great. we have something in Massachusetts, which really relates in some ways to today's show, because our guest is the chair of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee, Steve Kerrigan. Um, and wait till you hear his bio, folks. But uh, the Massachusetts Democrats just had their caucus season to elect delegates to their convention this fall. So I went to 23 caucuses. Wow. And I know it was it was fantastic. I, I really whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, get involved in your local Democratic or Republican town committees. You meet people who you're going to like, who care about the issues that you care about. It's wonderful to come together. Am I right, Pam? You're nodding. Yeah, you know it's, it's fantastic. I mean, we don't do the caucuses here in New Hampshire, but I always encourage people to get involved in there, whether it's a Democrat or Republican um, yep. town parties and get involved because they're like, yep. Great way to meet people, number one, get yes. socialized, number two, but also like get information and know what's going on. Yes. Meet candidates yes. from different offices. Yeah. You will be better informed, no question. Um, and if you want to find out about my campaign, just go to maradolan.com and you'll find out really everything you need to know. And I'd love to hear from you if folks are interested. Um, it's a huge district. Governor's Council districts are bigger than congressional districts because we've wow. got nine U.S. reps in Massachusetts and only eight governor's councilors. So my district includes parts of Boston. South End, Fenway, Beacon Hill, Alston, Brighton, and it goes all the way north to Burlington and all the way west to Marlboro, which is, it's huge. Trust me. That, it's huge. that is huge. So what it's happens huge. when you go to a caucus? Like what, what, well, what do we, you do there? Well, they allowed me to speak, which was very nice. So I got to talk about my campaign and, and got more supporters that way, which was terrific. And 
we elect delegates to the convention. So people run for delegate. And, you know, in a lot of the towns, they had more seats than they had delegates to fill. But in some, there were competitive elections and people would get up and make speeches as to why you should vote for them uh, versus voting for someone else. But it's 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 really great. It is. I mean, I love this stuff. But for folks right. who are just even a little bit curious, go. Seriously, just go. Yeah. So is caucus season over now or yes. are they still going yes. on? The caucus window is over. So it went from like the end of May um into what's july now so it went into like mid-june so it's about five or six weeks that is a lot because i know i would talk to you and you would say hey i'm running to whatever whatever town for this caucus and i'd be like oh mara you're really i'm on my way to lexington i'm on my way to acton i'm on my way to yeah wherever yeah brookline wherever it was well brookline was brookline was on zoom but all the boston caucus caucuses were in person and um, it's 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 great it's uh, and you know because you've run for office it's just wonderful to be out there talking to people, yeah. hearing about the concerns and talking about the things that, that you care about. It's a very bonding and strengthening thing. And also, and we talk about this a lot on this show, it's, you know, it's good for our country. It right. is. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I don't know about Massachusetts, but in New Hampshire, um, we always talk about retail politics, but going door to door is a really big thing here in New Hampshire. So whether you're just running for like a town oh, yeah. office or a state representative, yep. Um, Congress, whatever. There's a, a young fella named Jay Ruas who is running for mayor of Manchester, New Hampshire's largest city. And he keeps posting these updates and I keep getting these updates. And he is like going door to door on a daily basis to all of these places. It's incredible. But that's a great way for the average person, you know, who may not vote. And someone comes to your door and knocks on it. And you can have a conversation with this person, right? And you can say, I like you. I don't like you. And maybe you like that person and maybe you want to go vote for them. It's, it's a really right. way to get people involved. All right. And I always tell people who are thinking about knocking on doors, but a little intimidated because they feel like they might not know enough to do that. No, no, you do. Cause you don't have to know everything. You just need to think about the things that you care about. So if there's, a, so if, you know, if you, if what you really care about is public schools or public libraries or the environment or whatever it is, then you can talk about those things. And if somebody asks you something and you don't know the answer, you can just say, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. And then you can find out or you can let them know that somebody will and, you know, the campaign will be in touch with them. So yeah. don't don't be intimidated by the process. I know that's great. That when I was a candidate different times, I, I've knocked on doors and, you know, people have come to the door and been like, what, what do you want? Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're like, I was sleeping. And you're like, I don't know, it's noon. You know, I, I was not, I didn't expect you to be I sleeping. I apologize. You know, so there are times like that. It was not the best experiences um, a couple of times, but for the most part, it's always great. Exactly. For the most part, for the most part. And a lot of times people aren't even home. And so you're really just leaving literature for them to read, which they appreciate. And one of the most important things that you do when you knock on doors is you tell people when election day is because you think everybody knows, but they don't. Even people who are paying attention, who care will say, oh, really? Election day is next week? Yeah. And, and the campaign will often give you information as to where their polling place is. So you can tell people where they need to go to vote. So just providing those two things. I mean, I, I find that, um, you know, that's, that's really the most important thing. You're not really telling people how to vote saying, here's what's going on. Here's where the election is. Here's where your polling place, you know, here's election day. Here's your polling place. This is what this candidate stands for. And we hope you'll vote for them. You know, right. It's very, exactly. it's yeah. It's, it's not just, confrontational, right? You know, like you don't go up there and knock on someone's door, but there no. are times when people maybe confrontational. Like I said, like I, I've woken up a few people before and then you feel really bad. I've never had like, that happen, Pam. I have to say that I've really? never woken anybody. Up. Yeah. You know, I yeah. feel bad. Cause like, if you're, maybe if you're like a police officer, like my husband worked third right. shift, he worked midnight. So he was asleep during the day, you He's know, sleeping. like, you know, you yeah. feel bad or someone has a factory job or any, I don't know, any kind of job where you work in different shifts. It's, and then you wake them up that's and hard. feel bad a couple of times, but that's hard. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But the other thing folks should know is that the campaign will tell you which doors to knock on. So I'm a Democrat. I'm going to be knocking on doors of registered Democrats. That's those are the only doors I'm hitting. There's no point in knocking on anybody else's door because as a Democrat, I want to get Democrats to the polls. And the same thing for if you're knocking on doors for a Republican, they're going to send you to Republicans' houses. They're not going to send you to Democrats. What about independents? Did you did you hit the independents or no? I have not because what you really want to focus on are the, the people who you know are going to go and vote in the next election. So we have voter databases that tell us Republicans have this too, that tell us, you know, who are the reliable voters? Who do you know is going to go to the polls? You want to make sure that you 
get those folks to go to the polls for your candidate. Yeah, there's a whole smart. science around this. That's why it's called political science. <laughs> right, exactly. It is. I mean, it's like exactly. it's big business and people may not even realize it. It is, it is. For sure. All right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next, our guest today, Steve Kerrigan. I'm so excited to have him on. He is the chair, as I said earlier, of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee, new chair. And uh, he was the chief of staff of the presidential inaugural committee for President Obama. He was Senator Ted Kennedy's political director. He is the founder and president of the Massachusetts Military Heroes Fund, and he serves as president and CEO of the Edward M. Kennedy Community Health Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. And by the way, those are just some of the highlights of his resume. We are so pleased to welcome Steve Kerrigan to the show. Well, hi. Hi there. How are you? I'm great. Pam and I are so happy to see you. We've really been looking forward to having you on the show. I just want to tell folks we are welcoming Steve Kerrigan. He's the new chair of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee. But listen what, to what else he has done. He was chief of staff of the presidential inauguration committee for President Obama. He was Senator Ted Kennedy's political director. He is the founder and president of the Massachusetts Military Heroes Fund, and he serves as president and CEO of the Edward M. Kennedy Community Health Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. And folks, those are actually just the highlights. I'm not going into all the, the, the really, frankly, big deal stuff you've done. I mean, you were you were the nominee, Democratic nominee for lieutenant governor and yep. chief of staff, the attorney general. Okay, I'll stop now. But welcome, <laughs> welcome. That makes to me the feel show. great. You can keep going, talking about us. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly have we certainly have a lot to talk about. As you know, Steve, I'm a Democrat, and in the interest of full and fair disclosure, I'm a member of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee. Pam is the Republican on the show, and we talk to people of both parties, and we're respectful, and we listen, and sure. we don't put each other down. And we think this is a really important style of dialogue that we need more of in this country. You're nodding. I am, because I think I'm, look, I, I'm a firm believer. I'm an ardent Democrat, but I'm a firm believer in a strong two party system. So I, I think the only way you can have good conversation about good policy and politics is if you do it respectfully and, uh, and hear the other side. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that, Steve, because I am hearing more and more people from both parties say, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, but I really believe in the two party system. I'm one of those people. Pam? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, we had um it was a couple episodes back. We had Corey Lewandowski on the show. And, you know, Corey's like pretty bombastic and everyone knows how aggressive yeah. he is. And he talked for a while about how this type of forum is really important. So it's it's funny when you hear someone like that say, wow, it's really important that we have these civil conversations about issues and just agree to disagree. It's it's interesting right. to hear certain people say that. Well, as you know, I as as you mentioned, Mara, I I started in politics working for Ted Kennedy, uh, who was an ardent partisan, um, but who passed the most pieces of bipartisan legislation uh, than any legislator in the history of the republic, and he did so by uh, being fervently for democratic values and democratic principles and policies and fighting for them um, <clears throat> during the daytime, but also respecting and understanding his uh his friends and colleagues on the other side of the aisle because uh, that's the only way they got things done was by keeping that open dialogue we've gotten into a world now it really i think started in 1994 uh we got into a world now where um if you even talk to the other side you're a heretic and yeah. um and it's just as bad on i mean i would think it's a little bit worse on the extreme of the right but the extremes of anything um uh create that sort of bombastic attitude that um, any compromise or any conversation is a betrayal of a, who we are as a party. And I just think that's, um, I always say absolutisms and politics are absolutely the wrong thing to, to do. You're well, right. Steve, and I actually, I really, oh, no, go ahead, Pam. That reminds me, just what Steve just said, it reminds me of, I think it was 2012 when New Jersey was hit with that massive like nor'easter hurricane, Easter, hurricane yeah, yeah. and it like ripped apart the jersey shore Storm, and Storm sandy i think or something yeah. yes that was it and president obama flew in to mm -hmm. um, new jersey and chris christie met with him and they shook hands and they went and there were republicans who were just going out of their mind yeah. like he's we're you know he's dead to us he's talking to president obama and you're like this is his state he is the governor of a state that has just been destroyed you know and, and that that bothers me right that's just yeah. that's not that's not yeah. 
And I actually, Steve, I really appreciate your saying that because I haven't shared this on the podcast and I don't even know if I've shared this with you, Pam, but before we started doing this, I was nervous that some of my Democratic friends would say, what are you doing talking to Republicans? But I've been presently surprised that actually nobody has said that. Nobody. Right. They've all said, this is great. We need more of it. More. Powerful. I mean, that's the thing. I, you know, I, uh, I am firmly who I am. Um, I may learn something having a conversation with somebody else, but I'm not, you know, just having a conversation with a Republican doesn't mean I'm signing up for the Republican Party. Like yeah. it's, it's it um the idea that that a governor shaking the hand of a president asking for federal dollars to to because when you're in a in a disaster, you're not in, from New Jersey, you're not from Massachusetts, you're yeah. an American in need, a human being in need. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, at any rate, so I, I'm I'm always focused, and I thought of this the other day when I saw Pete Buttigieg on CNN talking about um, that ridiculous Ron DeSantis video, but uh, oh, and I thought his answer was great in that he said, you know, it, it, public servants should wake up in the morning, politicians should wake up in the morning trying to find problems they're trying to solve, like try, try to, like, what are you going to do to make things better for people? Not waking up trying to divide more, but anyway, yeah. I think as long as you're willing to look at it through that lens, I'll talk to anybody. And on on that very topic, we did want to have you come on to talk about the Biden economy. Sure. And I'll tell you, frankly, as a partisan um, and just a, a student of policy, there is so much good about the Biden economy that I frankly, I'm like, it's it's hard to know where to begin. Um, but but I will start by saying this: it's a it's I think it was the Clinton administration, the Clinton campaign, the first Clinton campaign that coined the term "it's the economy, stupid," and that has stayed with us because people really do vote along economic lines yeah. so please just just start us off i i seriously don't know where to begin so, i mean is it is it what biden has done for un unemployment numbers record unemployment record unemployment for women by the way women have the lowest unemployment in the last 70 and years for african-americans yes yeah. yeah um i mean the unemployment rate at least last month was lower than it's ever been in my lifetime and i'll be 52 in september um, right. uh, and I, I say to folks all the time when they ask me about the president's age, which I'm sure we'll get to at some point, but I say that the only number that, that I think most average everyday voters care about is not his age. They care about um, the 13 million jobs that have been created uh, within his administration, the record unemployment, um, low unemployment, right. <laughs> the investments we're making in their communities um, through the infrastructure bill, the billions of dollars that we're seeing. Um, put back into the pockets of of businesses across the country through um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the work that they're doing there. Um, so, I mean, that to me, it is the economy stupid. That was James Carville in the late oh, yeah. 90s. Um, because that was quite staggering in 92. Remember, George H.W. Bush had just won a war in a matter of days and had you know, yeah. I think 81 or 91 percent approval rating nine months before Election yeah. Day. Um, but the economy hadn't bounced back. Now, it was on its way back. Um, and the reality is that it bounced back early in the Clinton administration in large measure due to some of the things, and it's probably, probably would get pilloried by my Democratic No, friend, no, no. But in large you. measure due to some of the things that President Bush had done. But the yeah. voters voted on what was happening in their lives in that moment, <clears throat> which is why when things like the Inflation Reduction Act get passed, when uh, the infrastructure bill gets passed, uh, everyone was clamoring, saying, oh, my God, you know, the numbers aren't great for the president. All, I, all I kept reminding folks is these were passed early enough as administration that shovels will be in the ground, dollars will be in people's pockets, jobs will be being created by the time Election Day comes around. Uh, and I, I think you're just going to see better numbers over the next year um, that will just help uh, propel the president into a second term. So my my question, and I I don't, you know, I'm obviously don't agree with you guys but you don't buy any of what i just said i don't buy any of it but, like, <laughs> but that's okay that's um, quite right. i would have, i would be shocked if he did right so <laughs> but i always think like when i go to the grocery store you know and i'm paying five dollars for a dozen eggs yeah. or i'm going to the gas station and i'm paying you know 389 for a gallon of gas yeah and i i don't see how the average person who doesn't really, you know, get involved in policy, doesn't understand all this stuff, but they're like, hey, I work maybe like a single mom, right? I work, I got a couple of kids, I maybe work two jobs. But when I go to the gas tank to fill up, it's I can't afford it. And so we can't go on our summer vacation or I can't buy 
you know, cereal for you. I have to buy sure. a different cereal because I can't afford it. So talk to me about inflation. So I would say this. Um, I do think people do that for your question, right? Um, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Um, and I think a lot of people are going to be asking that. If you look at where we were, not inflation wise, and I'll get to that, but <clears throat> look at where we were as a country in November of 2020, arguably, um, most people will be able to answer that question with a firm yes by by November of 2024. Now, yes, we did see a spike in in uh, in gas and oil prices, largely due uh, to President Putin's folly in, in the Ukraine and attack on the Ukraine. Um, you know, I said to a friend of mine who lives diagonal across the street from me, and for all my Biden signs on my lawn in 2020, he had Trump signs on his lawn, uh, and he would send me all the time gas prices and. Uh, one day he sent me a gas price listing all these, and I sent him back the gas prices in Germany were eight dollars and fifty cents mm. a gallon. And I reminded mm. him that Joe Biden is not president of Germany; that um, the gas prices are not. Just as by the way, the president doesn't create the thirteen million new jobs, uh, it creates an environment in which they can be created. Um, he is not responsible for the for the price of gas, but he is responsible for finding ways to alleviate the impact on people, um, which is why he's pushed for the Inflation Reduction Act which as gas prices started to go back down to somewhat normal, I mean, they're not going to be the way they were when we were kids um, ever um, because fewer people are driving gas made vehicles, um, fewer homes are requiring on home heating oil, which means um, the price is going to go up because of, of simple economics. Um, uh, so people, um, he works hard to reduce other impacts on people. You know, they're working hard to reduce um, student loan debt. They're working hard to um, make sure that pay equity becomes a reality and that people get paid more. They're, they're working hard to make sure that um, health agencies and others have the resources they need so that that cost can go down in people's lives. So, um, you know, inflation is is a significant uh, impactor on people's voting patterns. But I think what you'll see is it's on its way down. I'm not an uh, economist. Uh, had the election happened a year ago, must, might be a much different scenario. Um, but I think they're, and the Republicans are smart. They name, they're very good at naming things, your party is. Um, uh, and uh, whether it's an accurate name or not, the death tax, not an accurate <laughs> name, but, uh, or a name I'll never use, which is Ronald Reagan uh, National Airport. I never will call it that. Oh. But, uh, it's a whole other, <laughs> a man lays off 1,500 uh, air traffic controllers in his first month as president. We name an airport after him. It's crazy. But um, <laughs> it's very insulting to organize labor. <laughs> Um, at any rate, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, they wanted to wrap that around Joe Biden's neck so that he could never say it because it was, has had the word inflation in it. Um, and uh, I think the president's leaning into it because it has had significant um, positive impacts in people's lives. And they'll see it. So I, I want to ask you, Steve, too, as you know, the spokesperson for the Massachusetts Democrats, I'm looking at this, this great chart that shows real GDP shortfall relative to pre-pandemic trends, which is quite a mouthful. And this is a chart, right? And it shows that the United Kingdom, look, the United States is, has by far done a better job of reducing inflation yeah. than any major industrialized country in the world. And this is due to Biden economics. Yes. How are we gonna convey that to voters across the United States? I mean, that's always the tricky thing. And to Pam's point, people aren't um people aren't necessarily reading the, you know, the op-ed page of the Globe or the New York right. Times or, or even the journal. Um, they're looking at their wallet and they're looking at the stack of bills they got to pay every month. Um our job is to work with, uh, which is why one of the big pushes we're doing at the state party is reinvesting in our local democratic committees, mm. which is mm. no secret, um, a passion of mine. Because um, my neighbor hears things from everybody, and he he gets he's got his his views. Although he is far less, he will not have a Trump sign on his lawn in twenty twenty four. He has told me that. Um, That's interesting. Uh, yeah, he is one who who was was ardently anti Hillary. Uh, Trump sort of populist, um, unpolished way appealed to him, yeah. uh, and then frankly, um, he lost him with. Um, the way in which he executed himself um, uh, over the 2020 election um, and January 6th. But at any rate, um, our job is to make sure that local town committees, people, peer-to-peer -peer contacts, neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor contacts, like bringing yep. it down to the basic local level. Like there is a project going on on our street that we have wanted for 
at the end of our road that we've wanted for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Uh, that is money that is coming through the infrastructure bill that was passed in the Biden administration. Um, having those conversations with people to make sure they understand the cause and effect of who you elect and, and the impact. I mean, we all know this. Most people can't stand Congress, but for the vast majority of them, mm -hmm. they like their member. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and as Barney Frank always used to say, um, people hate government in general, but love it in specific, right? They, <laughs> yeah. they, they want that thing they need to work when it needs to work to work. Uh, and so it's important for us at every level of government and at every level of politics to make that case and to not cede any ground. Um, we used to, in the Democratic Party, particularly here in Massachusetts, not get involved a lot in local races because they're technically nonpartisan. Um, uh, we've seen a rash of, of uh, MAGA-like candidates running for school committees all across Massachusetts. For the most part, they've been defeated by folks who don't believe in book banning, which is um, a odd phrase that we have to say here in Massachusetts. But yeah. um, but that that was allowed to grow even that little bubble or a little seedling because we weren't necessarily focused as much as we should have been on the local. <clears throat> and we take um, for granted, uh, and I said when I got this um, chaired, that we would never rest on our laurels on anything. Um, and we can't because from those seedlings come... Um, voters who are either disenfranchised or uninterested or don't understand the impact um, of elections on their day-to-day -day life. And that's our job. Uh, and I don't mean just our job at the Democratic Party. I think it's our job as citizens to convey that to our fellow citizens um, on either side. Like, make the case for your people because um, people want to hear from their neighbor. They don't want to hear a talking head on television. I agree with you. I totally agree with you, Steve, because I know Mara is a, is a policy wonk, right? Yes. I mean, I don't, right? I think you'd call yourself by it, but yes, Mara's like, I read the statement. Wall Street Journal every day and she's really into it. I am not. I, you know, I'm more of like a, a macro rather than a yeah. micro. And I do, I like, I, I admit, I like what you said, that you try to relate things when you're talking to someone about something that impacts them personally. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it is true. I and mean, sometimes you talk about Congress, you're like, oh, my gosh, like nothing gets done. All they do is fight. Blah, right. blah, blah. But, you know, if your congressman comes knocking on your door or you need something from your congressman, like you enjoy talking to them and you're so glad they're there. Yep. So I totally get what you're saying. But I, I do agree with you. Once once an issue becomes personal to someone, then you start to pay attention. And yeah. I think I've, I've said this on the show before, but my I have a husband who's very sick. He's terminally ill. And right. so I've become much more aware of like rights for people who are disabled. And, and mm. it's just, it opens up this whole other world where, you know, before you were like, if you would ask me like, oh, do you think you know disabled people should have certain rights? I'd be like, of course I do. But you don't really think too much right. about it. But now that's all I do is think about that, you know, and how yeah. we can help more people. Um, so yeah, it is really important. I agree with you when you start relating things personally to people. Yeah. I, I learned that. I remember a time and I, I wish I could remember the kid's name, but uh, I was one of my first jobs with Kennedy was his, his scheduler. So I got to meet almost everyone he met just before he did um, and sit in on some meetings. And there was one family that just happened to be in Washington to advocate for cystic fibrosis research. And this was like in 1993 or 1994. And um, they just, you know, just like Hill days, people come to lobby their members. So they happen to come by. We set up a quick meeting um, with him to say hello uh, and meet the young boy who was, I think, eight or nine, maybe 10 uh, at the time, which back then cystic fibrosis did not have uh, a very good um, life expectancy. Um, and Kennedy like cleared a, you know some time off his schedule. Once he met this kid, then brought over our health aides. Uh, and we started, he, what went from a, a very simple meet and greet um, he saw a policy opportunity because it became personal, right? He met that young boy and saw there should be something we can do to help people. I know I think about um, Brian and Alma Hart, um, who are from oh, Massachusetts, from Bedford. My who friends. Are good friends. Well. Yeah, yep. very good friends um, who lost their son, um, PFC John Hart, uh, in Iraq in 2003, August of 2003. Um, and Senator Kennedy met them at his funeral at Arlington Cemetery and they happened to be talking and he mentioned that John had just sent a letter home saying they weren't getting enough armor and that they were worried their vehicles didn't have up armor underneath for I, um, IEDs. 
Kennedy went back to the Senate, worked with then Senator Joe Biden. They got the largest investment in um, up armory, and it was too late for John. But John's legacy was telling his parents this was a concern of his because he he perished from wounds that he was hoping to avoid in that letter. Um, but because of that connection, you can you can see the direct impact of the work that you're going to do. And so it drives you even more. And so um, I always look for politicians to support who have that element where for them, politics is very personal and policy is very personal. Yep. And the Brian and Alma are friends of mine as well. Oh, and I, I didn't, wonderful. I didn't, didn't know the whole story. That's an incredible story, but I'm reminded. And this is one of the things I love about this podcast is that the conversation goes where it goes. I'm reminded of something that I heard once about Senator Ted Kennedy, sure. which was that his constituents knew that he was doing everything humanly possible. And if he came up short, he would get up the next day and start all over again. Yeah. And I, I believe that that's true. That is how people felt about him. That's how I feel about Joe Biden. I <laughs> yes. trust Joe Biden. I think he's doing a phenomenal job. But I know that even among Democrats, there are some folks who don't have that perception. And when I look at these numbers, I go, how can you think he's not doing everything humanly possible? Look at this. He has reduced the deficit more than any other president in history, over right. 1.7 trillion, Let's which see, is a really important point to Republicans. It right. is, but ask any rank and file voter what that means. And they have no right. idea. That's it's just right. like avoiding the debt ceiling crisis. Right. They don't understand it, which means either side, when it favors them, can demonize it. Um, you know, the Deficit Reduction Act, which was passed without one vote, um, one Republican vote in 1993, eliminated the deficit over the Clinton administration. Think they yeah. got credit for that? No, not at all. Um, because the average everyday voter doesn't understand right. what that means. Um, right. uh, but you're right. I mean, he's he's cut the debt as much as you can, given the massive increases relative to what it would be had they not taken any actions. It's still higher right. because that's the way money works. But um, yeah, no, it is. Um, I will say Biden and Kennedy were are a lot alike in their approach because they, I think, spent a lot of time together in Washington um, fighting for the good fight. They were drastically different as, as backgrounds, of course, um, but um, but their same attitude. I remember when we lost the vote on the Clinton healthcare bill back in 1994. I mean, it was not even close. It was a disaster yeah. in the end. Uh, he came back to the office and we'd worked on it for 18 months, came back to the office and um, somebody said to him, so what's next? Like, what are you going to do? And he, paid, he didn't even sit down. He reached over to his assistant's phone, picked it up, called Nancy Kassebaum from a Republican from Kansas, uh, and pulled out pieces of the health care bill, crafted the Kennedy Kassebaum bill that allowed for the first ever portability of health care, protecting mm -hmm. pre existing conditions, all those things. He, he just he he had this devastating loss, but then realized you got to get up and figure stuff out people depend on you to resolve things. And I'm sure the president um, uh, would love more people to get what he's doing. But I think the fact that he, and I said this about President Obama, that um, passage that was very risky to pass, push through the Affordable Care Act when he did. Uh, a lot of people wanted him to focus on jobs only and not healthcare. He realized he had a window um, that could be transformative for 30 million Americans. Uh, and I, although I've never heard him say this, but I firmly believe that had that passed as it had, and it cost him re-election, but those 30 million people kept their health care, it would have been worth it for him. And I think that's what the president, the president looks at at um, his time in the White House as limited as it is um, to move the ball down the field and get things done. Um, I firmly believe had Donald Trump not been a politician, he might not have run in 2020, but he felt, as he said in his announcement in 19, um, that um, he was the right person to run against Donald Trump. Uh, and I think if Donald Trump wasn't running in 2024, who knows what might have happened. But yeah. I, I believed back in 2019 that Joe Biden was the right person to beat, uh, beat Donald Trump. And I believe it and know it in my heart of hearts now. So let me let me ask you guys both this. And I, I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to spring it up anyway. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> OK. The president's age. And when I see him on television, I am like, oh, my gosh, 
this guy is so old. He has no idea what he's talking about. Like he uses the wrong words. He gets people's names wrong. He says crazy things. Like he does some crazy stuff. He's always like, kind of like shuffling around a stage and there's no one around. And I perceive him as being not fully there due to age. So I would, I would encourage you to watch a video of Joe Biden from 1990. Hmm. Um, he would stutter. and I mean, he had a terrible stutter as a child. Um, he sometimes would mess up people's names. Um, when you're doing as much as he does in a given day, I, I mean, I couldn't do what he does and remember Seriously. everybody. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, like president Obama didn't have that problem, you know, like president Bush, president Trump didn't have that problem. Uh, well, like, excuse me, president Bush, president Bush didn't have that problem. President Bush, come on. Now. George W. George W. Bush messed up more names than, um, than I care to remember. Um, okay. But not like but age but, related. But, like but, I'm yeah, exactly. you walk well, into so a door once too. Related? Who says so here I will give you this, and I don't think this is what you intend when you say comments like that, but I say this to anybody who does, um, because someone mentioned this to me when President Biden was running the first time. Ageism is the only acceptable form of discrimination that we have currently in society. It is okay yeah. for yeah. us yeah. to say, have this conversation. Like, is he too old? Yeah. Um, because he's 80 years old and running for president of the United States. Anyone who's president of the United States who puts them through that rigorous um, schedule would flub a name or forget something, let alone someone who had a debilitating stutter as a child, um, uh, you know, all those things. But the the idea that the mere fact that he's 80 um, it should be a limiting factor to him. I'd like you to tell it to the, you know, 13 to 15% of Americans who are 80 and over uh, who mm -hmm. vote. Um, I'd love them to make sure their voice is heard for the for the 80 year olds. Um, but yeah, he's a much different guy than my dad was. My dad passed when he was 80. Uh, my dad couldn't have been president, but my dad mm. hadn't been um, in the United States Senate for 36 years, hadn't been vice president for eight years, hadn't made a career out of being able to do this good work and do it as hard as he has. Um, this is a guy who gets up every day and exercises. This is a guy who, who uh, has made service his focus in life, um, uh, has never had a drink not, and all those things, like just very focused. Um, so, you know, People are going to vote on him regardless with whatever reason they want. I would caution people not to vote based on age because um, I don't think that's the number that matters. Um, and I think if those who question it, just watch him, watch his results. This man has gotten more done for this country than any president in my lifetime. More right, for but the that's economy. just Right. And then what I'm saying, Steve, is that I watch him. And yeah, but you're not going to vote for him anyway. I'm not voting for him anyway, but I'm, right, I'm not true. saying like, oh, he's 80. I'm not I'm not voting for him. He's 80. There's no way. It's not that. It's like no, he's 80 and then question. I watch his actions and I'm like, what's oh, my the, gosh. What's the cutoff? No, I don't think there is a cutoff. I think so is it 77? No, no, I don't think there's a cutoff. My dad's 88 and literally is playing golf yeah, but, right but now. For like, you as a voter, like why? why what, what's the no, no, so it's, it's not, not an age thing? It's so not, it's not an, an age thing. thing. Why are we talking about an age thing? It's age plus the way he acts. It's so eight plus that. So we just see things differently. Like, I mean, I, I just, you guys are like, he's spry, he's up, he's out, he's this, he's great. He I never said the word spry deal. because that implies um, <laughs> that, that that's a whole other, it's again, that's plus, an ageist plus, term. Spry, I, I, as if spry. no 80 year, Yes, it is. Because it's, it's, it's suggesting that, oh, well, he's spry. He can get up out of a chair. Good for him. Yes. Like, no, he's an 80 year old man who bikes on a regular basis, uses his Peloton a lot more than I use mine. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but I, I'm not an ageist. So I'm not an ageist. I'm no, saying I, I look at his age and I, I look at his actions. You were suggesting. I didn't. I said that I just I qualified that at the beginning. I didn't think that's what you mean. But a lot of people who bring up that trope of his age do it without the consequence of someone saying, you know what, um, ageism is the only acceptable form of discrimination that exists currently in today's society. We wouldn't have this conversation and say without consequence. Well, I mean. You know, if he was a woman, he's a woman. I mean, how right. many times did that conversation happened right. back in back in the day or even not that long ago? Should a woman be in this position? They they operate different. You know, I mean, that would not that would be terribly unacceptable. And we'd all or be canceled weight. when we should be. Right. Suppose he suppose he were 200 pounds overweight. Could we right. say, well, he's too fat to be president? No. Right. right. Or, or, by the way, what if you were in a wheelchair? Right. The guy on the wall behind you, I think. Oh, that's Harry Truman. But I thought that was uh, FDR. But I mean. Yeah, and that's right. a fact. If, if we had television in every living room in America in 1932, I'm not sure, sure. FDR would have been elected president. That's true. 
But I want you to know, Steve, that Pam has previously said on this podcast more than once, she is like your neighbor who once voted for Trump and is not going to vote for Trump again. Right. Well, I, on behalf of the nation, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, I, I should clarify, though. I, I should definitely clarify that. If he is our party's nominee, I yeah, will I vote know. for him. I will I vote for him begrudgingly, but I will I not be voting for him in the primary. Yeah, I mean, I, my, do, you, uh, do you vote in Massachusetts? No, I'm in New Hampshire. That's too bad. Do you want to move to Massachusetts? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> but no, I mean, I just I, I said I said I voted for him in 2016, voted for him in 2020. I'm just done. Like, I'm tired of it. I'm, I I'm will say my neighbor, so you're, you're close to like my neighbor. My neighbor won't vote for him in the general. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I will. Yeah, for sure. OK, well, we've talked Pam and I have had personal conversations about party loyalty and, you know, understanding that, you know, it's that's that's important. Um, it is. I get it. It is. But Steve, I just, I, what I really want to convey to folks is if you have any questions, read up on the Biden economy. The White House has put out a ton of stuff with all the facts and figures at your fingertips. There are so many things that we couldn't even go into it. The bipartisan infrastructure law is responsible for 35,000 new projects. This is targeted public investment that it will also attract more private sector investment. It's really about, it's it's a total rejection of trickle-down economics, isn't it? It is, um, because trickle-down economics doesn't work. Um, right. Never has, never will. Um, right. And uh, it helps the top 1%, 2%, but that's about it, um, and hurts the rest of us. And this is, the president believes in building an economy from the bottom up and from the inside out, uh, from the middle out. Um, uh, and he understands that the middle class build America, um, and he wants to support that. And so, um, the 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 investments that the infrastructure, which by the way, Democrats are just as guilty of this as Republicans, although uh, of having themed weeks um, of infrastructure week and all that jazz. <laughs> um, uh, we've all had seen a message calendar in a campaign headquarters. Um, Trump had a, 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 I think, infrastructure week every week of his entire yes. four year term, yeah, and yeah. did nothing. It never um, came. It's similar to the repeal and replace of uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, right. which they also named Obamacare to try to go after Obama, and now he embraces it fully. Right. Um, uh, and so do the 30 million Americans who have health care. But, um, you know, they had replaced and uh, repeal and replace. They never came up with an actual replacement. Um, so I think what, what this president is showing is um, it is not just about campaigning on ideals, but it's about delivering. For people um and delivering for people no matter who they voted for no matter what part of the country i mean the first infrastructure um event he did was on a bridge between kentucky and ohio um mm. and standing there with mitch mcconnell um That's while right. republicans were trying to pick a speaker in the in the house he was standing there with yeah. the the republican leader of the senate um yeah. talking about the investment in kentucky and ohio um and the, what it means for people and um so you know i i i hold out hope that the American people um, see the results that Joe Biden has delivered for them. They see the Bidenomics, um, again, something that the Republicans named, but now we're embracing. Um, we should probably just wait for them to name things always and then just embrace it. It's easier than us trying to figure out a name. It's um, true. Look what's happened to Dark Brandon. We're, it's it's ours. I know, now. right? Yeah, Go exactly. Dark Brandon. He makes jokes about it all the time. It's fantastic. Dark Brandon? Uh, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a play on that Let's Go Brandon thing, which is just... I just have one more question for Steve. Pam, did you have a, one question before I... Yeah, I have actually it just kind of popped into my head, like yeah. when you were talking about um, working so closely with um, Ted Kennedy. What do you think of RFK Jr.'s oh, candidacy? I almost, I just, you're breaking up. I can't. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's interesting, right? I almost honestly, got to the end. I was sure I, you know him extremely I well, do. right? And and I think there's like a small, well, I don't know, there's a portion Steve, of your I'm, party I'm, that people like. Steve, I'm totally comfortable talking about that. Um, you don't have to if you don't. Oh want no, to. I'm, no, I, I've known Bobby for thirty plus years. Wow. Uh, uh, known him very well. Uh, I've seen his career progress or not uh, and move in its many iterations. Um, he had a very strong dedication to the environment that I admired. Um, and as uh, a lot of his family does, you know, was working hard to lift up those who needed that support. Um, I can't, um, for many reasons in con good conscience, support him. 
uh, in his campaign for president. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I find it odd. Anybody who um, um, has seen so many healthcare issues in their family uh, to mm -hmm. fight against vaccines, um, uh, to fight against um, science, just seems odd to me. Um, the people will have their choice. And there was an article, I guess, today about how he could win the Republican uh, or the Democratic, he could win the Republican primary too, but um, uh, he could win the Democratic primary in New Hampshire um, because of how um, independents can vote in the in the primaries in, in, uh, in New Hampshire. That's possible. It is what it is. Um, I think the president is right to stay focused on what he's got to do uh, and uh, continue to do the good work for the people of, of this country uh, and that impact, frankly, folks all around the world. Um, people have a right to run for office if they'd like to. Uh, Bobby has decided to do that. I think you have a good sense by the vast numbers of his family who are strongly supporting uh, the president in his reelection, um, uh, where I think that'll all shake up. And that fantastic answer is why he is the Massachusetts Democratic <laughs> State Committee Chair. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. Very nicely done. So my last question for you, Steve, is just what do you what do you want to leave folks with? What do you want folks to remember and think about in terms of the Biden economy? I mean, I think folks should ask themselves on a regular basis um, the question of, um, you know, where is my life now versus before uh, Joe Biden took office? Um, what type of, we all decide when we go into the voting booth, what type of leaders we would like to support, right? Uh, hopefully we do that before we get there and we um, fight for our candidates and recruit people to run for local and state and federal office um, who reflect our values and our ideals. Um, I think anyone in the United States of America who looks at their own personal economy and the, the national and international economy can see the leadership that Joe Biden um exudes um, and presents for the country compared to, frankly, four years of chaos um, that existed. I mean, this is this is going to be the first time in a century or so where you have two one-term presidents running for mm. a second term. Mm. Um, so you, this is not a theoretical issue. You can compare two first terms of two men running for president. Um, I don't think you put those numbers up anywhere uh, just from an economic perspective and you see um, uh, any option other than to reelect the president. Uh, by the way, reelect President Joe Biden, not the other <laughs> one. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that's it's, it's quite as simple as that. Um, it's, you know, the character um, and conviction over the chaos um, of Donald Trump. And I don't think the voters of the United States, I mean, Donald Trump has about 35% of the vote. Everywhere he yeah. goes, about 32 to 35 percent of the vote. That's it. We have to keep him there. Um, and we have to keep him there with the facts. Uh, and his entire politics is about division. And it divides to support himself. It divides to support his businesses. It divides to engrandize himself and make himself look like some great autocratic leader. Uh, it is never about how you can actually do something. How you can improve someone's lot in this world, how you can invest in our country. It's never about that. It's always a grievance. It's always he's been wronged. Uh, and the American people, to Pam's point earlier, like they look at their bills and they see what's happening or not happening. They want a politician, whether or not they're getting the job done every single day to move that needle or not, they're trying. They want someone who is who sees them every day um, and doesn't see them as a pawn in their own personal, political, and professional um, battles. Um, yeah. And, and you know, I think Donald Trump is, um, has done nothing to advance the cause of this country and done an awful lot to try to tear it down for his own good. People will see that Joe Biden has done the exact opposite, dedicated his entire life, um, for good or for ill, to advancing this country um, and making it a better place. Um, hopefully they'll see that. They'll see the numbers and they'll vote for Joe Biden in November of 24. Well, Steve and, and listeners need to know, we are, of course, having Republicans on. We're having Republican candidates for president come on. They're going to give us another view. So please 
please keep listening to hear all sides of this. But before we go, I want listeners to know, and Steve, personally, I want you to know, Joe Biden has a special place in my heart, partly because of my sister, Eva. Um, she didn't have a lot of money, but when she was living in New York City, and whenever the New Hampshire primary was in 2020, she got on a bus and she went to Manchester and she knocked doors for him in the sleet. Mm. And at the time, people were doubting Biden's candidacy and people would tell her that he should drop out. And she would say, Joe's going to win. And I know that if he, she were here today, she'd be saying the same thing. Yeah. Joe's going to win. Yeah, yeah it's... Um... I, I've been a fan of Joe Biden since the mid nineties. Um, I remember first time I saw him speak on the Senate floor, he late night and he um, talked about how his long walk from the Capitol to the Union station and how he went home to see his kids every night. Oh. And, um, and, but he also talked about the, as he was walking to the train station, looking back and seeing the glow of the Capitol at night and how inspiring that is. But really, the real work was back home, um, taking care of those kids and doing the work for the people of Delaware. I um, mean, the man is a true public servant who puts others above himself every day. Um, and my husband is a military brat. Uh, and I have to say that Dr. Biden has done more, along with Mrs. Obama, uh, more for military families and and uh, and what they uh, the struggles that they go through moving from post to post and dealing with the great uncertainties of their of their, their family member service. Um, you know, we we give Dr. Biden great thanks for uh, for the work that she does. And so I will say this before you let me go. I wish I had written it down, but in February of 2017, I turned to my husband on the couch and I said, the next ticket for the Democrats will be Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Whoa. And I didn't write it down. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. Way to go. Yeah, yeah. But again, I didn't this write is why he's the state count. party chair. I mean, it this doesn't <laughs> count, Steve. You have to write it down for it to count. I know. I correct. Know, I know. No, correct. That is, Lesson learned, that is... Pam. Lesson learned. Why why Kamala, though? I'm just curious. Like, why in 2017? Why did you say Kamala? So um she was uh is a young, dynamic um uh woman, woman of color. I believed strongly that our next ticket had to have uh a woman. Um uh, on it. Um, so there was that that piece of it. Uh, I believed Joe Biden for all the reasons that he did run, would run and, and could win and was probably the only one who could beat Donald Trump. Um, and uh, we had fantastic. And by the way, it's I love big primaries, um, not when the president's running for re-election, but uh, <laughs> I love them because they, they're great um, airings of the views and we as a party become better, our candidates become stronger. Um, I believe that for for both parties, but um, I believed he was the, the best person for that, and, and I I was a fan of hers. Um, and frankly, you know, um, uh, who knew if he was going to do one term, two terms, whatever? But he had to have somebody as vice president who, um, as everybody says, the, the most important decision a presidential candidate makes is who their their vice president will be. Um, and I thought she had what it took to lead the country, and I still do. Uh, and so I believe that they were a, a really good ticket and they could, I mean, let's be, let's be honest. She is a biracial, she's a, you know, African-American, um, uh, South Asian uh, mm -hmm. woman who's incredibly smart um, and talented and accomplished um, and should have been on everybody's short list for vice president, um, if not for president. And so um, I thought, I always thought from the get go, they made a great team, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was interesting when, I don't know if you remember in August of, 19 when she took that jab at Biden at a debate. Oh yeah, I remember um, it vividly. She called yeah. him a racist. I was <laughs> well, like, that's what I still not, don't understand. It's like words. No, yeah. But yes. Yeah, uh but I thought that was that was bold. Um it was bold. Yep. It was really uh, bold. And he clearly he didn't it didn't impact him. He didn't, I mean, he I think he appreciated that in a yeah. in a debate, moments like that happen. You've got to take your shot. You've got to make your point. And and it was a valid point. Um, but uh anyway, yeah, so that's why I thought. Biden Harris. Interesting. And that's why I still think it today. Yeah. Good. I think I think it today too. This has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve Carrigan. Thanks. Chair Steve. of the Massachusetts Democrats. We'll we'll be in touch and I hope that you'll you'll give us updates. We'll do. Yeah. Happy fantastic. Back. Take care. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks so Steve. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Oh, that was a great discussion. Great yeah, discussion. He's great. He's Isn't like he? a, he's great. I mean, he's really obviously extraordinarily accomplished in his own career in politics, yeah. right? So he's just got an amazing background and a wealth of knowledge, right? That's that's what you want really for your party chairman, frankly. It really right? is. Yeah. And as, as you were saying in the beginning of the show, and you were so nice to ask me about going to the caucuses, the delegates are all really enthusiastic about Steve as our party chair. It was very, very, very popular choice. Right. And he is, and he also, he speaks incredibly well. He expresses everything well. It's very so. relatable, frankly. I, I, yeah. You know, very yep. relatable. Yeah. I, I well, don't like people who use like big words. I'm always like, oh. No. Right. No, but he's, so he's like relatable. Yeah. He's totally right. So you are now two and oh, because we've had two Democratic state party chairs on the podcast. You really liked both of them, Ray Buckley and yes. now Steve Kerrigan. You know, Ray Buckley. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, yes. We, we, we got I'll have to get on one of those GOPs. You're gonna have soon. to get us a couple of Republican state party chairs, Pam. And then <laughs> while while the two of you are having a love fest and whoever exactly. the Republican is that you want to exactly because that's essentially what it was you two were like it a did. love fence with joe it biden into a it's a love triangle <laughs> it's like, that really is how i feel i mean it does have something to do with i know like, yeah but it's i know i know like, i know yeah. how much you love him and it, and it is funny because we talk about this this is the pem- premise of our podcast like i could not disagree with both right. of you even more like 100 percent disagree do not right. see what you see but at the same time right that but that's the whole point is that I see things one way you see things another way but like I love that about you and I really appreciate that about you and I you know I see you as a shining example of what is possible because as Americans this is what we have to do and you know when you're having your love fest with the Republican guest that I'm going to extend the same courtesy to you and I'm going to listen and try to see things the way that you do and even though I don't agree with you I'm going to gain an understanding which is essential because right. united we stand. Yeah, no, actually that was, that was a really good um, education for me on Bidenomics, frankly. I mean, yes. like, so yeah. I understand where you're coming from. Like I, I, I get it. So anyone who's listening yep. is going to say like, okay, I, I understand you right. throwing out some facts and figures. You guys are talking about that. I totally get it. Um, yeah. I know when I went to see vice president Pence about a month ago, um, I remember I was sitting I there and I was he's your favorite right now. Yeah, I know. I love him. Mean. But I was like nodding my head the entire time. Like I was like, yes, like right. everything you said, I was like, yes, 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 yes. Right. And so, yeah, right. You get so comfortable in your party and your party politics. But to be fair, I mean, there, there are things I really appreciate and admire about Mike Pence. So I, I would never vote for him. I don't want him to be president. Right. But there, I do see good in him, mm. you know? Yeah. You know what yeah. I also respect is like, I also respect anyone who is willing to throw their hat in the ring. Oh yeah. Right. And anytime when I ran for state Senate here in New Hampshire years and years ago, and I lost, um, but I remember someone like was like roasting me in a letter to the editor. I think I sent a letter back and I was like, toss your, toss your hat in the ring. <laughs> then I'll actually pay attention to what right. you're saying. Until then, right. I really don't care, right? I know. Right. But it is true, right? Like until you have some skin in the game. Oh, it's hard. You know, I'm running right now and I'm running yeah. against an incumbent who just lied about me just on live television. Yeah. Made false accusations about. Me. I mean, it's tough. It's right. hard. Yeah. It is. You got to have thick skin. It's you do. You have business. To have a thick skin. Yep, you do. You do. <laughs> but we're a couple of tough criminal defense attorneys, Pam. <laughs> so That's right. Nothing scares me. We can handle it. Anyway, this has been really, this has been great. a great discussion. He was and fantastic. This is, those, this is one of those things where I really enjoy the conversation while it's happening. But when I go back and listen to the podcast, I'm going to appreciate it even more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. He was okay. great. We'll have to have him on sometime. We will. Yeah. As, as things proceed. So thanks to everyone for listening, for joining us. Again, you can find us on all podcast platforms. Please subscribe and give us a five-star review so that other people can find us. Please follow us and repost us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Going to Spare Us and drop us a note so we know what you think at pamandmara at gmail.com. Thank you so much. And remember, Pam... This is the place where your political adversary may end up being your best friend. Ta-da! Yay! Yay. So true. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.